If you go back 10 or 15 years and you ask yourself of all the scripts that are sold, let's put them into three different categories. We have paradigm driven scripts. We could also call these formula driven, rules driven. So these are scripts where like if you watch a, a, a bunch of three camera comedies, it's the same story structure, just different jokes. Or you watch a bunch of um, superhero movies over the summer, it's kind of the same story beats are happening at the same time. So these are formula or paradigm driven scripts. So that's one category of scripts that people can write and try to sell. Then there's imitative scripts. So when Breaking Bad was a phenomenal hit, everyone was writing their version of Breaking Bad. Or people would write their version of Arrested Development. So you'd read someone's script and you'd be like, oh, this is like Mad Men, but kind of different. And then the third kind of script is pitch perfect authentic. And so that would be a script that, like when you read the pilot script for Orange is the New Black, it's not like anything you've ever seen. It's like Orange is the New Black. Love it, like it, hate it, it's completely original. Uh, we've never seen these characters, we've never seen this world, and the story is not formulaic. It doesn't hit these preordained plot points. It unfolds in a way that's most compelling for what Genji Cohen, the writer, is trying to communicate. Mad Men's another example, Community, uh, Sopranos, we could just go on and on, uh, Moonlight. So these are scripts that don't follow a paradigm. They don't imitate what somebody else did. They're a wholly original piece of work. Original characters, story, and way of telling that story. So if we go back 12 or 15 years, on the TV market, who's buying Pitch Perfect Authentic scripts? HBO, Showtime, that's it. Everyone else is basically buying paradigm-driven shows, genre-driven shows, or a show that imitates a successful show. So if you wanted to break into the business 10 years ago, even seven years ago, you might follow a formula, you might follow a paradigm. Also, you're looking to get staffed on a TV show. So TV shows hire lots of writers. So if you want to be a comedy writer, you might write a, an episode of Jane the Virgin or an episode of Silicon Valley. If you're a drama writer, you'd write a version of a drama to prove that you could imitate a show. Everything's completely different now. So now when you ask yourself, who's buying pitch perfect authentic scripts, HBO, Showtime, Netflix, Amazon, AMC, FX, and the networks, basically everybody. And the reason is they're all chasing the key demographic, which is 18 to 49. And our generation, we've grown up on on-demand, video-demand platforms. So we've seen so many movies, we've seen so many TV shows. We know what's original and we know what is imitative. And by and large, our generation doesn't watch formula. And so basically, the, the key demographic wants something that's original, wants something that's new and different. And there's so much you can watch on TV, it really needs to be special to grab your attention and so you to be loyal. So people are loyal to Transparent. They're loyal to Game of Thrones. They're loyal to Jane the Virgin. And these are pitch perfect authentic shows. So I've read every script that has sold in the last three years and the vast majority are pitch perfect authentic scripts. Now, there are paradigm driven scripts that sell. There are imitative scripts that sell. But the people who sell those are people who have a real serious track record in that genre. And what agents will always tell my classes is, if you have a standard follow the dots comedy or drama or procedural, unless you've been an executive producer or above, on a hit show in that space, in the last three years, your script's dead on arrival. No one will even read the script. Further, showrunners now, when they staff shows, they won't look at imitation scripts. They don't want to look at your version of a show. They want to read a Pitch Perfect original sh uh, script. And what they always tell my classes is, if you can write to a show, if you can imitate my voice, if you can follow a paradigm or a formula, that doesn't mean you're a great writer. If you're an amazingly great writer, you can ape my voice, you can follow how I tell my stories. So it's really heartbreaking because there's so many books and classes and seminars that probably made a lot of sense five years ago that are teaching people these paradigms or teaching people how to imitate and, and a set of rules that no longer applies. So it's like writers are being trained for a war that doesn't exist anymore. And just real quick in features, if you're going to work for the studios, 
you are going to be doing a Pixar film, a Star Wars film, or a um, Marvel action film. That's basically your three choices. And they, Pixar has a, a way they tell their stories. Marvel has a way they tell their stories. Star Wars has a way they tell their stories. But I have students, I just have a student who's got her first writing job at Pixar, but the script that she wrote was a pitch perfect authentic script. So even though when they hire her, they're going to expect her to write a Pixar script, you don't break in with a Pixar script. You don't break in imitating or following a formula. You break in with a script that when everyone reads it, they go, holy moly, who wrote this? I, this is amazing. This writer, I have to meet this writer. I have to be in business with this writer. So when you look at the writers who are writing all the features for the studios, they either have amazing track record of credits like Lawrence Kasdan or they wrote an amazing pitch perfect authentic script that no one had seen before blew people away and then marvel's like hey would you be interested in doing our you know whatever movie we're making and yes at that point when you got hired you're certainly going to write it the way marvel wants you to write it but the mistake i see is so many writers write their superhero scripts or their paint by the number scripts and they can't figure out why they can't get a career they're just simply writing the wrong kinds of scripts When I work with writers, this is the, the first thing that I teach them. And I think that this is the foundational skill set, and I call it creative integration. And so the way it works is writers tend to work from one of two places inside themselves. And it has to do with the brain. And there are a conceptual part of the brain and an intuitive part of the brain. And most writers tend to be more conceptual or more intuitive. So conceptual writers tend to work outside in they tend to be very concerned about the story, that the story is logical, that the story makes sense, that the story is interesting to other people. Conceptual writers are very concerned about what other people are gonna think about this writing and will they think this is good, will they think I'm a good writer? So they want really interesting things happening and they want a lot of interesting things happening and they want it to make sense and they want it to have causality and that's really, really important to them. Intuitive writers are completely different. The intuitive part of the brain doesn't care what other people think. It just cares about what is authentically true to you. So intuitive writers are navigating towards what they would do in that situation or just what's interesting and compelling to them or what the character would really do. And it's a very different way of writing. One, the conceptual is outside in and the intuitive is inside out. So a conceptual writer would say, I have this great idea and I've got to figure it out. I've got to break the story before I could write it. If you don't know where you're going, how are you going to get there? It's a very systematic, logical approach to writing. The intuitive writer is going to be someone who says, I need to write this out to figure out what the story is. They find it through the journey. They find it through exploring. Intuitive writers explore. Conceptual writers decide. And they each have different inherent strengths and weaknesses. So let's start with conceptual writers. Conceptual writers, when you ask them, why did you write this? What, why is this script important to you? It's almost always a big idea, a what if, something that could be commercial, a new way of doing a comedy. I thought this was a great idea for a horror film. Or it's a theme they want to explore, an intellectual theme. And so they're really good at big ideas, big concepts. And they're really good at making sure everything happens for a reason and there's forward momentum and there's causality. And they have lots of interesting things happening that we're just not that interested in. And one of the reasons we're not that interested in it is their characters are never compelling enough. Their characters feel kind of like they were invented to tell this story because they were. They're kind of like puppets who are there to tell the story. And we just don't get an emotional connection to the characters. The other reason that they hit a glass ceiling they can't get through is there's all these interesting things happening in the script, but we're not that interested in them because we don't feel anything. Because the writer didn't feel anything when they wrote it. And it's an energy transference business. So conceptual writers got great ideas, lots of big, great things happening, but the characters just aren't where they need to be and it's just not emotionally engaging. 
And most of those writers know that, but they don't know what to do about it. Intuitive writers are the opposite. They bleed on the page, and these characters are like real people to them. They don't invent the characters, they don't design the characters, they discover them. And that's why a lot of intuitive writers don't often get lonely when they write, because they're spending time with their friends, they're spending time with people that they care about. And so if I'm working with a conceptual writer and the character's not engaging enough, they'll say, well, what can we do to change it? Should we make her older, younger? Let's make her bisexual. Let's change her ethnicities. Let's take her arm off. Let's make her quadriplegic. What can we do to make her... If I'm working with a deep intuitive writer and their characters aren't interesting enough, that would be like talking to a mom and saying, your daughter's not that popular at school. Let's take her arms off. Let's make her quadriplegic. Let's make her older. It'd be like... That's crazy, this is a real person. You can't change who they are. Intuitive writers, like they're very connected to their characters. And as a result, they tend to create really compelling characters, really compelling emotion. And these really compelling characters are forever searching for a compelling story they can't find. Because the intuitive writer is so inside out and so connected to emotion and character that part of them cannot create strong story. It's the, the conceptual brain has a perpendicular processor and it has a certain way of thinking and strengths and weaknesses. The intuitive brain has a parallel processor. And anyone, if they're interested, um, you can email my, uh, my assistant, which is lisa at coreymandel.net, and we can get you a bunch of information on this if you're interested. To take this further, what happens is most writers, if not all writers, when they're writing, they're trying to write the best script they can write. And if you're smart, and writers are very smart, you play to your strengths and you hide your weaknesses. So if I was uh, playing tennis against you for the championship and I'm really good at my forehand, but I'm weak at my backhand, I would try to play everything to my forehand and hide my... And you, of course, would try to make me play my backhand. So writers are always writing to their strengths and trying to hide their weaknesses. And maybe they know they're doing it, maybe they don't, but they're doing it. I see this all the time. And so what happens is over time is their strengths get stronger and their weaknesses get weaker. And that is why there's so many writers who pour heart and soul and all this time and energy to have a career and they can't get there because their scripts aren't quite good enough. When I work with a writer, I will train them through creative integration. So what we will do is we will make them write to their weakness and hide their strength. So if I'm right hand, I do everything with my right hand and my left hand is really uncoordinated. If I literally tie my right hand behind my, black, my back for a month and I do everything with my left hand, it's gonna get stronger and more coordinated. Now during that month, I might spill a lot of things and be very uh, inefficient, but over time I'll develop my left arm, my coordination, the strength. Then I'll learn how to integrate the two. So for a conceptual writer, they will work exclusively from the intuitive part. They will learn how to turn off the conceptual part. The conceptual part is the part that has all these big ideas and worries about story a lot. It has all this anxiety and judgment and you turn that off and teach them how to create from a pure, authentic, emotional space. Now their writing may not be well structured. It may not be something they're gonna show an agent, but they will, through that process, their characters will come alive. Their dialogue will come alive and you'll, one of the key things when I do intuitive training is to get you to think about something in your life where you feel something very strong and then your writing, when other people read it, they're going to feel what you feel. So you can get people to have the emotional experience you had when you wrote it. Then when I help you learn how to discover actual characters, there's a whole bunch of training to get to the point where that's a real person for you. Then you can write that person from what they're feeling and people will feel that. And then you can start putting characters into conflict and it'll all be authentic characters. And so that's the intuitive training. And when they get to the point where their characters and their dialogue and everything is organic and authentic as best as the best writers out there, then I'll teach them how to integrate that back to the conceptual side so that they all have the best possible stories and the best possible characters. And then obviously for an intuitive writer, it's the opposite. They will turn that part of their brain off. They'll work purely from conceptual until they're a rock star, and then we'll integrate. And that process, it's just so rewarding to work with writers because if they come out the other end, literally their agent, their manager, or their spouse will say, they'll read a script and say, I love you, but you didn't write this. I hear this all the time. I don't believe you wrote this because 
your stories aren't this crisp and compelling. I mean, this has all your great character work, but you can't, like who, who helps you with the stories? Or someone will say, you don't write characters this great. I love you, I love your writing, but this is like, you know, Orange is a New Black or Mad Men. I mean, this is just that high level of characters. And it's like, it literally is transformative. One of the books that changed my life as a teacher is Mindset by Carol Dweck. I make all my students read it. It's the only thing I make them read. She talks about the fixed mindset and the growth mindset. And the growth mindset is, okay, these two people who their stuff's popping off the page, why? What skills, what talent do they have that other people don't have? And the growth mindset says talent is repeatable skill sets. And maybe you're born with them. Maybe you develop them through nurture and childhood, or maybe you learn them as an adult. It doesn't matter how you acquire them. It's just a skill set that's repeatable, as opposed to luck. So a repeatable skill set is, you know, you learn how to drive a car, and you can drive, now you can always drive a car, or ride a bike. And so they have the people that pop off the page, they have certain skill sets, certain tools that other people don't. If you can figure out what those are, compelling conflict, and then you can figure out how to teach compelling conflict, then you can teach those skill sets to other people and they can learn that talent. And with, so I, I, have, I had a writer that come, came to me, his name's Gary, and he had a manager and he was always taking meetings, but he could never sell anything, he could never get hired. He felt like he was that close to a career for five years. And then at some point you're like, okay, this, something's not here, something's not working. So he came to me, deeply intuitive writer. Um, the, he wrote the most amazing characters and dialogue. I didn't, all I taught him on that front was don't change what you're doing. <laughs> you know, like, you're amazing, just keep doing that. Don't let anyone interfere with that. But on the conceptual side, you've got some real weaknesses. And him specifically was escalations, how to keep making things get strong, like, keep making things worse and worse in an organic way. That was his, so he was an easy case in that he had everything but one skill set. He was really missing one skill set. So I gave him those training exercises and then unbeknownst to me, when I was done with that class, he spent the next three months doing those training exercises every day for four hours. I didn't know that. That's a growth mindset guy. That's a guy who's like, I want to become an expert at this skill set that I naturally am terrible at. And at the end of those three months, he was as good at that as a natural conceptual writer is good at that. He was just as good at that as anyone. He now has a movie come that uh, I think it's released in the fall starring, um, uh, what's her name? Um, anyway, not Reese Witherspoon, but someone like, anyway, he has a movie that, that come out. He has Great. a team of C agents. He sold two TV pilots. And he had everything but that one skill set. Now, at the same time, I've worked with writers who are great at escalations and, and great at big concepts, but their characters and dialogue, it's just like these are puppets. And through the intuitive training, they could come out the other end where their characters and dialogue are just as good as these people who are naturally great. So the key is you have natural talents, and then there's talents that you don't have or you're not that strong at. If you train the right way, you can, if you're willing to put the time and effort in the right way, you can end up being just as talented as someone who's naturally that way. And that's the growth mindset. The fixed mindset, first of all, believes that if you want to be a writer, you either have this talent or you don't. So then it's, you are constantly have this voice in your head that says, do I have what it takes? Do I have the talent? Am I wasting my time? Am I going to get a career? Or is it never going to happen for me? That constant fear-based chatter is that fixed mindset. And because of that, the fixed mindset, and you ask such a smart question, it desires an outcome. So if I had a script and I go, hey, will you guys read my script and just give me your feedback? I want to know what you think. There's the fixed mindset and the growth mindset, and they're both there. I don't think it's one or the other. I think they both exist. It's just sort of a ratio. Are you 90% growth mindset and 10% fixed? Or the when I give you guys a script, I go, just tell me what you think. My fixed mindset wants an outcome. It wants you to, to say, well, 
Now I know why you had a career. Now I know why you teach others. This is maybe the best script I ever read. I am, I'm literally in awe to be in the same room with you. I, I didn't know a human being could write this, this well. This, is, this was the most amazing script ever. Like that's what my fixed mindset wants to hear. And when it doesn't hear it, it's going to throw a temper tantrum. And at that point, it has two choices and only two choices, which is what's wrong with you guys or what's wrong with me? So you always hear writers out there say, yeah, my manager said that the characters weren't strong enough. You know, I got to change managers. I mean, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Or they'll say, yeah, my manager said the characters weren't good enough. I don't, I, I don't know why. I I'm no good at characters. There's something wrong with you. Or there's something wrong with me. That's the only choices that it has. The growth mindset does not crave or desire an outcome. It desires the truth. So the growth mindset wants to know what did you honestly think and why did you think it? And let's say that there are parts of my script that you really loved and there was a section of the script that you just didn't care for. Why? And not in a defensive way and not in an attacking way. But why? Because it, it's like a detective. It's like, hmm, what plays in my head is amazing. It's not amazing for you. I want to know why. Where is that disconnect? Maybe there is a piece of information or context that I knew that you didn't. I didn't get out well enough. And if I could just rewrite it so that becomes more viscerally clear to people, maybe you'll then have the experience I want. Maybe that section... I like it for very personal reasons, but it actually disconnects from, there's a whole million reasons, but if I, and, and maybe, maybe the reason you didn't love my script, the honest truth is the characters just weren't compelling enough for you. They felt kind of flat. They felt kind of like they all spoke the same way. That's not now a rewrite, which is the mistake most people make. That is, okay, I'm not yet strong enough at characters or the story, the characters are great, but it kind of wandered around and it just, it just didn't seem like it had that forward thrust. And maybe I'm just not good at that forward thrust. Great. The growth, the fixed mindset, of course, is freaking out. But the growth mindset is celebrating because it's like, okay, now I know what I can do moving forward to get better as a writer. Now I got to figure out how do I train myself to get better at forward thrust or forward, better at characters. And so... If you follow a growth mindset, when you get feedback, if you loved my script top to bottom, and I know the process that I use to create it, and I can replicate that process, that is great news for me. If you didn't love my script top to bottom, and I can talk to you in the right way to figure out why you didn't, where the disconnects were, and I could realize where I have a weakness, where I need to get better at a skill set, where I need to create a new talent or get better at a talent and I can figure out how to do it, that's amazing. So the growth mindset is not looking for an outcome, it's looking for the truth. So your question was really profound. Those 18 people, did they want to know that they were in the 18 people? If you ask them, they'll all say yes. The reality is if you were to tell them, and I never did, I never, I, I, that was for right or wrong reasons, that was a line I would never cross. I would never tell someone if I thought they had what it took or didn't. I just didn't want to, because I felt like that's just my opinion. What is my opinion worth at the end of the day? And I don't want to inflict that on someone positively or negatively. So I don't know. I'm not saying this was a, 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 the right decision, but as a teacher to this day, if someone says, do you think I have what it takes or not? Well, first of all, I'll say, go read mindset because that's a fixed mindset question. <laughs> but even if I actually have an opinion, I'll never tell someone. Um, anyway, but if, I, if someone were to tell those people, the, they would say, I want to know the truth. And that is true for their growth mindset, but their fixed mindset does not want to know the truth. It wants an answer. It wants a specific answer. It wants a yes. Or the fixed mindset would be okay with, I don't think you have what it takes, but I don't think it will take that long for you to get there. The, the fixed mindset's like, oh, all right, I'll settle for that. But anything <laughs> beyond that, and then the fixed mindset's like, well, what do you know? Or, yeah, I don't, you know. So, and the reality is, what I've learned is that we are always both fixed mindset and growth mindset. And if you really do the work, you can feel, you know, kind of the ratios. And in fact, like 
People often ask me why I teach and there's a lot of answers, but I'll tell you one of the main reasons that I do this is as a writer, I had a very unhealthy relationship with my writing. It was really a torturous experience because as a writer, I was about as fixed mindset as you could be. As a teacher, I'm about as growth mindset as you can be. So for some reason, teaching is that one space in my life where it is just so easy to be egoless and growth mindset. And you know, for other people, maybe that's religion or parenting or whatever. For me, it's teaching. Not sure why, but it is. And I didn't even know about mindset at the time. That's something I learned later on. A, a, a brilliant student said, hey, you should read this book. I think, and I was like, oh my God, where's this been my whole life? And, um, but yeah, so for me, teaching, I'm sorry, writing had all these demons and, and anxiety and fears. And it was just this, uh, I was, I was a very angry person. And, and it was either what the F is wrong with my agent or this executive and this, and just, or what is wrong with me. And that was my only two choices. And as a teacher, it's allows me to live in a growth mindset place and to be a much, it, it's very healing for me. And it's just, I get so much out of that. And then I really love working with writers and really helping them find and stay in that growth mindset because that is so important to a writer. I was in a uh, writing group and there were some professional writers. There's actually a Academy Award nominated writer we met at her house. So that was really exciting. And I'd written the script, they were giving me feedback. And long story short, it got to the point where they're like, this script's amazing. This script will sell. The only question is how much it will sell for. Do you want help getting an agent? And of course, that was like magic to my ears. And then I mentioned this to my uh, a professor at UCLA who, you know, a lot of really big writers had come through that school and through his class. And so he volunteered to read the script and he goes, this is one of the three best scripts I've ever read in 20 years at UCLA. And again, I'm thinking of all these amazing writers that, so I'm like, well, I guess I'm as good as those. And um, he goes, this will definitely sell. You want help in getting a manager or an agent? And I was interning for a manager at the time, just as an intern. So as a favor, as a favor to that manager, I'm like, do you want to read this? Because I'm like, it's going to sell. <laughs> do, you want, do you want your 10% or not, buddy? And so he agreed to read it. Took like three weeks, which drove me crazy. And then we had a meeting. I'll never forget. I go in there and he's like, this is a pretty good rough draft. Don't show it to him in the industry. Because when you show stuff to people in the industry, they get coverage reports on it. And those are database. That's your first impression. But if it's not great coverage, you haven't just blown your chances at that production company. They're going to share that coverage with everybody. It's a database. So you've, bl you've blown your first impression across the board. And he said, this will not serve you well, but you have some real strengths. You have some real weaknesses. You have, you know, some blind spots. I could help you with that if you're, and he's giving me this whole talk. And the whole time I'm like, what is wrong with him? <laughs> and I'm like, did I tell you what the Academy Award nominated person said? Did I say it with my professor who represented Stevens or, you know, taught Stevens? It wasn't, but anyway, you know. And he said, look, they were all telling you the truth. This is a better script than most scripts. It's an impressive script, but it's not nearly as good as what you need in the industry. He goes, look, your the people in the writing group are working writers. Your professor at UCLA, all smart people but they're not in the business of breaking writers into the business. I am. I know how good something has to be. This isn't close. Oh. And I'm like, didn't want to believe that. My fixed mindset's like, he's an idiot. And so what he said, and I'll, this was the best thing anybody could have said, is hire three studio readers, pay them under the table. If this script came through the tracking system, what coverage would you write? And then give me the coverage the honest coverage. And if the coverage isn't good, it's not gonna hurt you because it's, it, it's just you only see it, nobody else sees it. And I didn't have a lot of money, but I did this. I paid him like 100, 150 bucks, three different people, someone at Imagine, someone at Warner Brothers, and someone at Scott Rudin's company. And the coverage came back, and it, it wasn't terrible, and it wasn't bad, it was okay. Which is terrible, it, it, it would've hurt me. It was clear that this coverage was like, this is okay. Nothing special, nothing great here. Uh, and then on the writer, it says, um, you know, recommend, consider, 
I for, it, it was low marks on the writing on two of the three. And that, you can't hide from that. Yeah. And then the manager said, I'll work with you if you're willing to put your ego at the door and do this training. So I did, and it was like 14 months. Oh, wow. And it was grueling. He, he, was, he was not a good person, but, but his training was good. It was, he, it was Marine, it was much rougher than it had to be, but okay. And at the end of that time, he said, I now think the script is where it needs to be. I'll pay for coverage reports. And he paid for three coverage reports with three different people. Uh, real actual readers and it was all just exactly what you want exceptional coverage and literally three weeks later Ridley Scott hires me to write Metropolis I, I flies me to London I mean like my whole world changed my whole life changed and it never would have happened if that manager hadn't sort of forced me to pay for coverage and so because at some point the fixed mindset can't hide and that's what I always tell people if you're thinking like the biggest mistake you can make is go out to the marketplace before you're ready. And just because your friends think it's great, and just because your teacher thinks it's great, and just because the script consultant you hired is great. And I, I don't do it anymore. I used to do script consulting. But I say don't listen to those people because they often, they're running a business and um, a business wants happy repeat customers. So they often tell you what you want to hear. And even if you find a script consultant who has incredible integrity, which is rare, but they exist, they're not in the business of breaking writers into the business. And, and I wouldn't listen to their advice, per se. I know people who are like, I, the script consultant said this, this, and this. I went out to the marketplace, look at the coverage. It stunk. It happens all the time. I say, hire actual readers under the table in TV or feature, wherever you are, and get the actual coverage report that they would get. And if all three coverage reports come back, recommend, recommend highest marks, then you're ready to go out, then, then yeah, get on the highest mountain, pound your chest, and get everybody to read your script. If that's not the case, stay off the radar. You don't want people reading your material, it's gonna hurt you. And figure out how you can train yourself to get better. So, sorry for a long answer, but no, I was very fixed mindset. And if that manager hadn't done that for me, I'd be taking classes a day, I wouldn't be teaching them. I love my agent. I think he's the best agent in the world. I'm repped, I'm repped at WME. There's another agent at WME who I think is the second best agent in the world. Her name is Adriana Alberghetti. And she said something once that I think is so important for writers to hear. She said that some writers get it and some writers don't get it. And the writers who get it are all working. And the writers who don't get it, most of them aren't working. And so as an agent, she just wants to work with writers who get it. And this is what it is. A lot of writers think that, you know, to write a script that changes your life, to write a script that gets you your first job, or to get really Scott to hire you, or to get a show, whatever it is you're aspiring to, you have a career, but you're trying to take it to the next level. They think it's about writing the, having the right script at the right time at the right place. That's not it. That's a mistake. That surrenders all control and power to the universe. The reality is your job is to think in six script cycles. And you have to be writing the right kinds of scripts, pitch perfect, authentic. We talked about that earlier. And assuming you trained yourself up to be able to do that. You need to write six of those every two years. And the reason is, if you write six of these pitch perfect, authentic scripts, one of them is going to go out to the marketplace and just fizzle and you'll never know why. And then um, two or three of them will go out and they'll start to get some traction, but then something will happen and derail it. And then there'll be one or two that's absolutely gonna happen. You have the director attached, you have the stars, there's a bidding war, there's no way it's not gonna happen, and something at the very last second is gonna derail it. And one of the six will actually go the distance and sell, or it'll be that script that gets you the next three or four years of getting staffed on show. There'll be one of those six scripts that will just catch lightning in a bottle, one of those six. You don't know which one it'll be. So if you're not working right now, you ought to be writing three or four of these scripts a year because you're thinking in six script cycles. So any one script goes out and ultimately doesn't do what you need to do. You don't feel like a victim, that's one of six. This is the key, if you are working, you have two jobs now. You have your day job and your weekend night job. So if your day job is a feature assignment for Ridley Scott, or your day job is you just got staffed on Jane the Virgin, one of my students, just, that's why I keep saying just got staffed, she's very excited. Um, you have to do everything, you have to, that, you have to excel at that job. 
But then at nights or weekends, you got to be writing pitch perfect, authentic scripts. Um, and maybe you're not writing three or four a year. Maybe you're writing two a year because, you're, but you don't stop writing these scripts and creating these scripts because one of these scripts is going to be the thing that takes your career to the next level. And so the writers that don't get it is I'm working, I'm making money, I've made it. Plus I'm busy. It's like I have a family, I'm writing, there's no other time. And I get that. But the reality is the writers that get it, even though they're working, they're still always creating these new material and they think about it in six script cycles. And so a lot of times agents drop the writers who aren't doing that. And, you know, I get it because like when I was a working studio writer, I wasn't continuing to write these scripts. I was just doing my studio assignment work and I was making good money and I was really, I was just too busy. I didn't want to do that. My agent kept telling me to do this. I didn't. And he said, at some point your writing career is going to end badly. Um, and I worked nonstop for 11 years, but I was a working writer, but I never became an A-list writer. And the only way I could have become an A-list writer is to keep writing these scripts. So there was another writer, Eric Singer, who wrote a script and he started getting all these studio assignments and he was making a lot of money, but he kept writing on his own time, these pitch perfect authentic script year after year after year. And eventually one of them hit and it was uh, American Hustle. And so he's now suddenly a huge writer. I know the guys that wrote the Nick, same thing, you know, they're, they're staff writers and they were making really good money, but they were writing stuff that they really believed in and the Nick was one of them and that's and that script just took them to a whole other level. Um, Alan Ball with American View, we can go on and on and on. So often agents drop writers who might be really great writers, but they don't get it. They don't keep creating this new absolute. So it's either they don't keep creating material or they're not creating the right kind of material. It's not good enough. I have a lot of friends who are agents and if you keep creating the right kind of content, even when you're working and, you, and the content's amazing and you play well with others, it's very unlikely they're going to drop you because that's exactly the kind of person they want to represent. And in that case, if they drop you, it, it could be a conflict with their client. It could be a lot of things that have nothing to do with you. But if you're not doing all of those things, and an agent drops you, then you have to look in the mirror. I think that TV writing and feature film writing are different art forms. There's a lot of overlap, but they're very different. So I think that someone has to, first of all, say, do I want to be a feature film writer or do I want to be a TV writer? Now it's possibly possible they want to do both, but generally writers have a preference to one or the other. Now that said, there is so much more opportunity and money in TV than there is in features. Features are getting better, but not as good. Although I know a lot of TV writers who are sneaking over to the feature neighborhood because there's a lot less competition. But that said, I do have clients and students who want to be feature film writers, but want to become TV writers as their day jobs while they keep writing their Moonlight or their Manchester by the Sea or whatever they're writing. But what I would say is, you know, there's this training of all the creative integration and skill sets. And then when you really get to that, the, the, the last training of really designing and executing on your stories and your characters, it's di there's different training for TV or feature. So I would say if someone is sort of new to this whole game, I'd pick one of those forms and really get strong at that before you try to learn the other. I wouldn't be bouncing back and forth because then you kind of become kind of good but not great at either. Now, if someone's really great at one form, yeah, focus on the other. So it is really hard to sell a feature film original script, but it's getting a little bit easier, which means it's gone from impossible to almost impossible. <laughs> but it, I mean, I have in the last two months, I've had four, five, four students sell feature scripts. And so it is certainly possible, but you see more action on the, the TV side. But I think the mistake that a lot of people make is they want to go write a TV script because they think that it's, there's more action and it's easier, but their heart's not really into it. They don't really want to be a TV writer or they're not really trained to be a TV writer and they're wasting their time. So I, I maybe I'm a romantic, but I, I just think that 
there's going to be so much training and so much dedication and sacrifice to get into this business. And, and what people don't understand is that getting in the business, as hard as that is, is a lot easier than staying in the business. And if you're going to go through all of that, then do it for a career that you want. Do it for a life that you want. I mean, TV writing and feature film writing is very different. I was a feature film writer for 11 years. Um, I had total control of my schedule. Uh, I would take meetings maybe one or two, maybe one or two days a week, but only when I wanted to. Most of the time, I, I could be in Europe writing. I could be here writing. I could do whatever. I had so much control over my schedule. Um, I would work really intently on something for three or four months, and I could take two months off. TV writing is very different. Um, you're going to be working maybe eight, nine months intensely and then you get time off. You're going to be working in a room a lot with other people. Um, some people love that. Some people hate that. There is a lot more politics that can go in the TV writing. Some people can thrive in that. Some people hate that. Um, now as a feature film writer, I would constantly be writing scripts, pouring heart and soul into something that never got made. You know, I had friends, I had a friend who was a, a writer on Mad Men and she would write something and then, you know, a few months later we could watch it. And I was so jealous of that. Um, she was so jealous that I did my work uh, literally in Paris for two months at one time. She was very jealous of that. So I would say, like, think about your life. Think, what I always tell writers is, if I can guarantee you success writing for movies or TV, which would you pick? And whichever one you pick, if I could guarantee you success writing any kind of thing, you know, any kind of TV show, comedy, drama, or, or a movie, what would you pick? And then work backwards from there to see what kind of spec scripts you should be writing. And so have a vision for what kind of career you want, what kind of life you want. Work backwards and write those kinds of scripts. And that's plan A. And hopefully plan A will work. Now, over enough period of time, if plan A is not working, you can consider plan B. Plan B is what would be the easier script to sell? Where, where is the marketplace? How do I game the marketplace? Now, that doesn't set you up for the life you want or the career you want. That's just, I want an agent. I want to sell something. The mistake that I made that I hope others don't make is plan B was my plan A. I was in film school and I said, a, I, I heard the story how Jim Carrey, and I don't know if this is true or not, uh, was a struggling comic and he said, um, someone told him to do this. He, he, he wrote a check to himself for $1 million and he post dated it a year later. And he said, in one year, I'm going to be able to cash this check. And within one year, he got living color and he made millions of dollars. Is that a true story? I don't know. I hope so. I don't know. But I was 23 years old when I heard it, so I thought it was a true story. So I didn't write my, I, was, I started writing a check, but it, it was, I just couldn't do that. But I did write in my calendar, one year later, I will have an agent and I will have sold a script. I wrote that in my account. I told everyone, a year from now, I'm going to do that. So my, when we're walking, we move in the direction of where we're looking. That's our intent. So that was my intent. In one year, I'll have an agent and sell a script. And it, it was actually 13 months later, so I, I didn't quite make it. I had an agent. I actually didn't sell a script, but I sold a pitch to Ridley Scott, and he flew me to London, and it was on the front page of Variety. So I was willing to call that a success. Okay. And... What I realized is after I finished Metropolis and it was on the front page of Variety, Ridley was going to make it and he said very positive things about the script and me, I was named on the front page of Variety, made my mom's day and suddenly I was the hot writer in town and I was getting all these job offers and I remember thinking, all these offers that I'm getting are for kinds of things I don't really want to be writing. So I called my agent, I'm like, I don't really want to be writing those kind of things. That's so stupid. I'm like, I'll be writing these kind of things. So get me those kind of offers. And I forget what she said. She said she's such a polite, classy, smart woman. But she basically said, you idiot, if you wanted to be doing this, why did you write this script in Metropolis? Like, everything you wrote lined you up for this career. If you don't want this career and you want that career, why did you write those scripts? Why did you sell Metropolis? And the honest answer is because I was just trying to get an agent and sell something. I hadn't thought. I was 24 years old. I didn't, I was so fixed mindset. I said, if I can't sell a script in a year, I'm going to law school. Because if I don't sell a script in a year, it means I don't have what it takes, which is very fixed mindset and very stupid. And um, so I tell people, don't make the mistake I made. Plan B is, okay, I just want to get an agent. I just want to sell something. I just want to validate I can do this. But plan A is what career do I want? What life do I want? 
and reverse engineer what you should be writing to give yourself that. What I'd like to do is give the single best piece of advice that I ever got that I ignored. And so what happened is when I was on the front page of Variety and all these offers were coming in, um, there was uh, an agent at my agency, Barbara Dreyfus, who didn't represent me, but she took me out to lunch and she gave me the following advice. She said, the next script you write is the most important script you'll ever write. It will determine the trajectory of your career. So right now, you, you were an unknown person. Now you're on everyone's radar. You worked with a high-profile director. He's planning on making it, the movie. He said how great your script was. Everybody in town wants to work with you. So everyone is like so hyped up on you. Now, there are writers who are commodity writers. They, they go in and they write these big summer movies and these big action movies. They make a lot of money, but there's nothing special about them. And then there's writers who are A-list writers, writers who have these amazing careers. The next script you write will put you on a trajectory. So her advice was this. Don't take any job that you wouldn't have done for free, which is to say you love this project and you believe you could just knock it out of the park. You love this so much, you would do it without getting paid. Now we're gonna get you paid, but don't take anything that falls short of that. And you'll have to say no to a lot of stuff because most of what they're gonna offer you is crap or just not a good fit for you. And the offers will start to slow down and you're gonna panic and think you have to grab the next best one. Don't. And the offers will keep slowing down. And I'm telling you this, that even, you'll think the offers will eventually go away and they won't, but even if they do, literally you've said no to everything spec your next script and make it something that you love and knock it out of the park. Because she said, if the next one's amazing, then that puts you on a trajectory. That, then people see you a certain way. Later on is the time to do it for the money. Later on, we'll grab a lot of money. But right now, this next script, you're on, now everyone knows who you are. This next script is going to tell them what kind of writer you are. And when she said that, like, I had that chill up my spine. Like, this is absolutely true. I need to hear this and do this. And I said no to something. I said no to something. The third time I said no was a Disney project and they doubled my quote and I said no and they doubled my quote and I said yes. And I'm embarrassed to say that that project of all the projects was not only a script I didn't want to write, it was a movie I wouldn't even want to see. But it was sudden. I don't come from money. I had student debt and it was more money than I ever thought you could make in years and, and I was going to get paid for three months. And so the precedent that I set, I think with myself at that point is I'm in this for the money. And, and I, and that really locked me into a career path. And I, it was, I wish I could go back in time. I, I feel like that was a really big test and I failed it. If I hadn't taken that project and that project never got made, and, you know, as a writing sample, I think it was, it was good, but it wasn't special. If I had waited and waited and took something else, or even did something original, and if it was great, I would have made so much more money down the road, down the, I mean, mm -hmm. so, you know, my agent, you know, represents me, but he also represents Aaron Sorkin. Um, I worked nonstop as a studio writer for 11 years. I made a lot more money than I ever thought I could make. Do you know the difference between how much money Aaron Sorkin is made? I don't know, but I can, I'm sure that what Aaron Sorkin makes is not even in the same zip code as what I made. He also represents J.K. Rowling. Now, I'm not saying that I could have become Aaron Sorkin or that level, or I could have been J.K. Rowling. I don't know. But what I do know is that the choices I made prevented that from being a possibility. I was a studio writer. I just kept doing a bunch of action movies and some were action comedy movies. Sometimes I thought they were fun, sometimes I didn't, but I loved the paycheck. And I loved just making the money and the deal. And I never stopped and wrote from my heart. I never wrote. And I'll tell you, one of the main reasons is I was so fixed mindset, I was so afraid of rejection. I was so afraid that every script I wrote, I was afraid that people would say, oh, you're not that good of a writer, you're a fraud. Now, if I wrote something from my heart, if I wrote something that was authentic, that exposed me, 
into the material. Now they could say, you're not a good writer and you're not even a good person. Like they could reject me as, if they rejected my material and it was very personal, then that would feel like they were rejecting me as a person. And that was too painful. I was not going to allow that to happen. I mean, my agent was begging me to write something authentic and from my heart. My wife was begging me. My manager was begging me. My golden retriever was begging me. And I just wouldn't. And so it's just, it's just A, it was short-sighted. First of all, money isn't everything. But even if money is everything, I potentially could have made so much more money. But more importantly, I could have written stuff that I was in love with. And I could have, look, maybe I would have... I could have tried for that career. I could have written authentic stuff. I could have swung for the fences. I could have tried for that A-list career and maybe come up short. And, and then backed into the career I had. Maybe. That I, there's no, I don't know. But I know that the choices I made meant I was never going to have that career. I was never going to be creatively fulfilled. I was never going to be writing the stuff that I really wanted to be writing. I was never going to be writing from love. I was always going to be writing from fear. I regret that. And so part of the reason I teach is I want to help writers do it the right way and help empower them with the tool. I wish someone taught me creative integration up front and some of the stuff. But I, I, I hope that I can be an influence on writers so that they can have the best possible career that they're capable of and maybe even a better one than that. So it is really difficult in the beginning and a lot of writers have this fantasy or this illusion and I did and I was wrong is that you know you're you're working and you're making money and you ha and you're trying to write and you're so busy and writing so hard and and it god when you sell something and when you get hired then you don't you can quit your day job and you can quit this and you can just write and oh what a luxury that would be because you're so time starved but when you first break like when I first broke in the business you know, I had two months to write the script for Metropolis, but almost every day I had meetings and I had to go in meetings and I was talking about other projects and pitching and it, I actually was spending more time on that than I was on my day job. So I actually had less time to write and you were just pulled in so many directions and so discipline really matters. So one of the things that I teach writers from the very beginning, non you know, writers who are starting out, and then the one, and a lot of them won't do this, but the ones that do, not only do they become better writers, this will save their rear ends when they have a career, is I teach them the idea of a writer's schedule. So what that means is if you have a job that pays the bills, and Thursday at three o'clock, you have to do a marketing proposal to your boss. I know where you're gonna be Thursday at three o'clock. You're gonna be doing that proposal. Now if you don't feel like it, and you don't feel like the proposal's that good, you're still going to do the best you can. And if you feel like watching TV or napping, you're going to be there or you're not going to have a job. And, you know, from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m., you are supposed to meet with this client. You're going to do that. And you schedule your life around that. So what I tell people is no one is going to treat you like a professional until you are a professional. No one's going to invest money in you until you put the money where your mouth is. So you have a career, perhaps you have a family, perhaps you have all of these pulls on your time. I get that. Every Sunday night, you're gonna create a writer's schedule for the next week. And maybe you can only write 45 minutes a day, uh, ideally an hour or two hours. Let's say 90 minutes a day. You will block out that writing time, be it at 7.30 in the morning, be it at six o'clock, whatever it is, for every day for that week. Now, if you've blocked out Thursday from 7.30 to 8.30 is your writing time, I know where you're going to be at 7.30, you're going to be writing. And it's not, if you feel like it, because that's like your marketing meeting with your boss. So you schedule out your writing time every single week and then you honor that. And if you're not willing to do that and you're not willing to honor that, why should anyone else invest money in you? And so the writers who will adhere to that and have that writer schedule and stick to it before they have a career, then when they have a career, when they, they have that beginnings of a career. Because the beginnings of a career, it, it, you, you have so much demands on your time and all of these meetings, and you need to take these meetings. You need to strike while the iron is hot. Um, you, it really saves them because they'll carve out that time and they'll put everything around that writing time. So I think a writing schedule is really, really important.